Thank you. Howdy do. Uh, so before we begin, there are two things that I'd like to bring to your attention. The first is that in your registration bag, you should have gotten this. Uh, you might mistake this for religious propaganda if you don't look very closely at it. Uh, this is from the International Church of the Weird Machines. We believe that every machine should have the right to, at some point in its life, ex run an exploit. And so uh, we include instructions for all sorts of clever things in here. Uh, we've got puzzles in the back. We've got um, a centerfold in the middle, um, which is the schematic diagram to the Electronica Baca. This is a Soviet PDP-11 that I picked up. Uh, you would not believe how difficult it is to Google the proper way to typeset a LaTeX centerfold. Uh, you get all sorts of images, but nothing related to typesetting. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've, we've got a sermon in here that, that lets you think a little bit. We've got all of these images of streetcars from the 1890s that had different creative ways to push pedestrians out of the way when they collided. Um, ways to communicate between virtual machines. We have... Uh, articles from some of the talks that you'll see at this conference, and because they're written on paper, they're a lot faster to work through than trying to, um, uh, to go through a video or to, uh, to go through your notes. Uh, so please look through here and, um, and read the fucking paper because we spent a lot of time writing it. <laughs> um, this, this is Sami's dot, so if you like it, the, um, the raw files are available. On the inside front cover are the instructions for printing your own, and there is no copyright, and you have our, our blessing to copy it as far and as wide as you like. Uh, this is our 10th release. We have nine more where this came from, and uh, they're all fun. We have the Children's Bible Coloring Book of get, Proof of Concept or Get the Fuck Out. We have um, an academic issue coming up soon. Uh, I managed to get the word fuck into an academic CFP. It's been a life dream of mine. Um, the other thing, uh, there's this book here by No Starch Press called uh, Python for Kids. Uh, are there any kids here who would like to learn programming? <laughs> I'm seeing some rather old children. <laughs> are there any legitimate kids? No. Are there any, par are there any uh, illegitimate kids? Are there any parents of legitimate or illegitimate kids of the appropriate age to learn programming? Okay, now put your hand down if you're so much of an asshole father that you do know how to program and have not taught your children. <laughs> okay, seriously, who, who will give this a good home? You. There you go. Um, when I was growing up, I first learned basic from a, a book like that, and then they all went out of print in the, the late 80s. And um, for many years, there was nothing. And kids were taught to shut up and uh, click on the mouse or do word processing and to call that computing. And I'm glad that this dark time is finally ending and there are books worth reading again. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to talk about um, protocols for Leibovitz. Um, this is very, um, it's not very well known, but it, it's a very well respected science fiction book called a canticle for Leibovitz. Uh, a, a canticle is a Catholic prayer. Leibovitz is a Jewish last name. Uh, a canticle for Leibovitz is about a monastery that was founded by a Jewish electrical engineer who after the apocalypse, after um, nuclear bombs fall and civilization falls with it, he joins the Catholic Church and creates a monastery to smuggle books to preserve them for the future. And the book takes place over 1,500 years in which civilization barely recreates itself from the ashes as this monastery is preserving books for the long haul. Um, so we're going to be playing with HF radio. This is the sort of ham radio that works over international boundaries. So I can transmit a signal from my house in the United States and I can hear that here in Sweden. I can transmit to South America. Uh, if I get a little bit better antenna, I might be able to reach Asia. Uh, this is a great way to have international communication without relying upon infrastructure. 
This does not need access to the internet. This does not need um, anyone else's equipment except for my transmitter and whomever else's receiver to function. At the same time, there are rules. Uh, I have uh, a license to transmit on these frequencies, but I do not have a license to use cryptography. I do not have a license to transmit uh, content. Like, I can't play music. I can't uh, tell stories. I can have a conversation of a personal nature, but like, there are lots of restrictions here. So in this lecture, we're going to discuss different ways that you can hide a secondary message, while on the surface having a perfectly legitimate normal message. So uh, as far as anyone who is intercepting it sees, you and I are talking internationally about uh, my new antenna. And my antenna is 20 meters, and it's such a good antenna, and I love my new antenna, and I didn't like my old antenna. And as we're doing this, there's a secondary channel in which extra information is sneaking through. And the point of this is uh, less to actually send data illicitly, although, of course, we do want uh, some of that uh, in case of the apocalypse, but also to understand this protocol and more specifically, to understand the receivers of this protocol. As we go in, uh, we are going to review a whole bunch of things that we did with the uh, digital radio physical layer. And it turned out that the physical layer is not monolithic at all, and that it presents many opportunities to play with uh, its uh, different elements. And so, even though we're talking about bootlegging uh, and Matryoshkas as a way of uh, embedding messages and hiding things. Uh, we are really talking about parsers. So that's interesting, right? You say uh, a radio, I say a parser. And when you say a parser, I say this is a machine for executing data. Now, it is a machine to be programmed. We can affect it, we can uh, drive it from state to state by supplying crafted input. And of course, every exploit uh, worth the name is just that. It's a way of programming a machine with input. And guess what? Parsers are buggy, so you can make parsers do interesting things. And that's the foundation of our uh, discipline, if you will. Uh, but radios are parsers too. And they, too, are driven into their states, which, of course, look different from our processor states, uh, by what they receive. Uh, there is a trick to this, because there isn't all that much extra state, right? In uh, a typical software program, there is so much extra state that you can stick numerous Turing machines in there and execute arbitrary code, which, of course, uh, happens to your systems uh, every day. Uh, at the hands of uh, teenagers uh, and nation states and all that. But the machines in radio are simple machines. They don't have all that much extra state. So we should look for other surprises than extra state in uh, browsers. So we're not talking uh, beasts, we're talking cats. We're talking sneaky little um, cute tricks. And one of those sneaky little cute tricks is what we call parser differentials, right? There are two ways to build a weird machine. One is feed uh, a system some input and have it run away, elope with your input. And uh, it might actually get full to full Turing, although, of course, this is uh, uh, <laughs> nearly never required uh, for effective exploitation. But a more uh, sneaky way is to send a message that is seen in two different ways. So this is important. A whole lot of security schemes depend on uh, the same message being seen exactly the same way by multiple recipients. You know, your CA sees your X509 uh, certificate signing request, and it interprets a name out of that. And your browser had better see the same name. Your Android gets uh, a package and verifies a signature. And as it turned out, with the Android master key bug, uh, the part that verified the crypto signature saw a different message than the installer. And so God knows what you installed, 
uh, while your crypto verifier told you that it's fine, it's signed by a trusted authority. So what good is a crypto signature if you disagree about what's being signed? So parser differentials are deadly and important, and they're sneaky. And all of this happens in noiseless environments, right? The uh, input that gets to your machine is exactly the input that's transmitted to your machine. Uh, in Phi, there is this extra variable which is called noise. So bring in the noise, bring in the Phi uh, funk, right? The uh, famous Broadway musical. Well, the thing that makes Phi so much more interesting than software exploitation is that Phi has noise all over the place. And those machines that you build, and those machines in your digital radio that you can drive are driven by noise as well as by what you transmit. So we had a bunch of tricks. One of them was packet and packet, right? Uh, the endless stream of symbols that your radio pulls out of the air and then matches uh, into your frames, oh, how do you know where, where a frame starts? Oh, there is a marker. It's some bytes. There is a little machine in your radio that matches those bytes. What happens if those bytes get damaged by noise? Well, what happens is that you never know that the frame started. To you, the contents of it are still noise. What if the frame contains an exact representation in its payload of a radio frame, as it should be in that stream of symbols? Well, you would play this internal frame. You would receive that internal frame. Uh, your receiver would lock on, and you would receive it. You would receive a frame that was sent without using a radio, just by controlling the uh, application layer. Isn't so, that interesting? So you can inject from layer 7 down to layer 1 remotely without having your own radio. So you're injecting a raw packet controlling only a cat picture or a text message in another network without being nearby or having any physical access or any privileges to control a low-level packet. All because of a minor protocol bug at the lowest layer in a piece of the protocol that you would never see on a packet capture because it's considered too low-level. And this works. Uh, there is more. There is error correction, of course. So your codes that you receive over the air snap to predetermined points in the coding. So what happens is your radio receiver is rewriting automatically and transparently the signal that you are receiving under the assumption that the noise is random. Well, if the noise is not random, or if you control the timing of the signal, you can actually have the error correcting code rewrite your frame so that you receive a frame in which no single bit was as sent by the transmitter. Just reflect on this. Our example code for this works by sending the message off by one eighth of one nibble. That's half of a bit. Uh, and the, the way that we're able to do this is that the symbol size in uh, 802.15.4 is um, one symbol contains four bits. And it's implemented by having 32 chips, which a chip is like um, a lowest level one or a zero. There's 32 chips in a row, and these chip sequences are just the same thing rotated. So if you send, say, a, a one, and you left shift it by a little bit in time, that's a two, a little bit more and it's a three, a little bit more and it's a four. And this allows us to create a signal that at the lowest layer has none of the bits of the message we intend to inject, but the receiver automatically corrects for it. And this lets us bypass a lot of filtering uh, that was used as an early defense against this technique. So filtering for the strings that we use for injection are no more effective here than they are in a Stack Overflow article on how to re-enable magic quotes in PHP 4. And good luck building a uh, wireless IDS for this. 
and exploring all the different ways that you can uh, mishear a packet uh, because of noise. So hopefully by this time we've convinced you that uh, phi has parsers, phi which are uh, colloquially known as receivers, and that phi has really interesting effects uh, that do not occur in any other parsers anywhere. And so here is our mission statement. We're out to study those parsers. We're out to study those receivers. And our mission statement is to boldly go, um, construct signals that one could send with a commodity transmitter that would appear ordinary in a commodity receiver but will contain messages that another standard receiver will interpret differently. Again, you can call it stego, that's not our goal. Our goal is to build something that reveals the hidden properties of the receiving schemes and architectures. But of course, you know, book legging is good. And, um, you know, some of those matryoshkas uh, could be containing uh, forbidden knowledge inside. Um, but we prefer to think of it this way. Here is a signal, our bootlegging bear, and if you run it through one receiver, say AM uh, on top, then you get the bear. If you uh, run it through another receiver, like FM, you get the books. Like clean, um, schizophrenic, radio polyglot. Uh, but this works best when they're <laughs> orthogonal to each other, when the bear sounds like a very clean bear, um, and it doesn't look suspicious in any way to a human operator. Uh, HF modems are sort of unique in that the operator will often have the sound turned on, will be listening to the modem noise, and will be looking at a waterfall in his console as he selects which signal he wants. Um, this is different from, say, a dial-up modem, where you hear the modem noise as you're connecting, and then it goes away and it's hidden from you. So we said orthogonal, but um, that, of course, uh, is exactly uh, the interesting thing to explore here. The thing about radio circuits is that they're built for a certain modulation protocol. They ignore every other physical effect in the signal if the physics doesn't interfere with the physics of this particular modulation uh, receiver working. And this is done for very good reason, because as far as the modem's efficiency goes, your receiver should reject anything that isn't data. Uh, if it isn't data, it doesn't matter. Uh, when you have popping from an interfering audio signal, or when you have the atmosphere fading in and out, all of those effects should be ignored as effectively as possible. And the protocol designer is trying to make his protocol as error tolerant as possible. And this is exactly what we will use as a wedge. Uh, there are two more things that we will use as a wedge. First is error correction. Error correction is pretty much a necessity because you've got the phi, uh, you've got the noise, uh, but it's actually a machine for transparently rewriting the signal, so we will use that feature. And also we will use the fact that those encodings uh, used in legacy protocols are quite loose and forgiving. Uh, they were designed for human operators who make mistakes. So uh, encoding is easier to spot than deeper phi tricks, than modulation tricks, but we will show you both. Uh, there will be a visual code here. Uh, the uh, bigger uh, capa carrying capacity tricks will be illustrated by a bear. The finer, sneakier, but also less carrying capacity tricks will be illustrated by a cat. So, sneaky. Uh, before we jump in, we're going to review uh, the basics of phi. Uh, our apologies to uh, radio operators and trained signal processors here, uh, but this, uh, we need to revisit those uh, blueprints uh, for how you transmit information uh, on the radio. And generally, you know, how do you transmit information on the radio? You've got amplitude, frequency, and phase. You know, all you've got is signs. Like, all you need is love, all you get is signs. So in uh, the top one is the signal itself. That's what you want to put on top of your carrier. 
Um, beneath that, you have amplitude modulation, which is where your, your signal gets stronger and weaker on a particular frequency in order to transmit your information. And in FM, what you do is you, you change the actual size of each wave in order to vary the frequency while keeping the power reasonably consistent. Um, so in the FM1, the, the envelope stays about the same size. On the AM1, the envelope is changing. Um, uh, so, yeah, OK. So there's also phase. Um, and phase is kind of tricky to think about um, when you're new to this, because phase isn't something that your ears can generally recognize in audio. Um, uh, is it the sign you're hearing or a cosine, right? Right. And it, it's also difficult for the receiver to figure this out in absolute terms. So phase shift keying is always relative. Uh, is the phase different for this bit from what it was in the previous bit? Uh, and the, the sort of lie to children for how the transmitter works is that at some abrupt point, the signal jumps from being the sine wave to the cosine wave of the same position. Uh, we'll get back to how it actually works in a little bit. Uh, in a little bit. Uh, but the gist is that you can't abruptly jump from one value to another, because that makes the signal discontinuous. So you have to sort of slowly ramp down to zero volume and then come back up. And you can actually hide a channel in that as well. So I'm a mathematician by training. Uh, I know very little about circuits. So for me, uh, the world of radio consists of sine waves, right? For some reason, uh, due to the physical properties of the world, uh, you can make a sine wave that carries. And uh, of course, uh, it's just a thing, right? You can control uh, amplitude, frequency, or phase which means that there are three places to put your signal. And uh, again, from my view, the receiver does this Fourier transform. And it extracts the signal out of those uh, carrying frequencies, which are so useful for carrying, but are irrelevant for actual information transmission. So you, know, you can vary the frequency with time while your carrier uh, chugs away. Uh, and you have this sort of a a waterfall diagram, which is standard in, um, to, in tools, which you would think uh, does a um, Fourier transform. Well, in fact, it doesn't quite. Then you can uh, vary the frequency. And so you see that the signal varies around the, signal fre the central frequency. Uh, or you can vary the phase. And when you look under the uh, sign, uh, for the frequency and the phase, well, they're, they are not quite orthogonal, right? Uh, whatever happens, happens inside of the argument of the sign. Now, that creates a band. That's one of the concepts that I really struggled with until I understood that really uh, you've got the fastest rate at which your signal changes. Well, that gives you two sides uh, plus uh, or minus um, the frequency of the change to your central frequency. That's a band, and it is uh, going to be important um, uh, again for, for, for what we do. Because we're going to deal with the so-called upper side band. So uh, I'm not a mathematician, um, but I am a, a ham radio operator. Um, in our view, these things work a little bit differently. Um, in amateur radio for long distance communication, something called upper sideband is the most common modulation. And upper sideband is uh, like a, a bit confusing when you're, you're first building radios as circuits. But in terms of what something will look like on the air or what the audio you're listening to looked like as it was a radio signal, upper sideband is the easiest to reason about. Because in upper sideband, you're just taking a chunk of radio spectrum, and you're moving it so that it's now in audio spectrum. And you're doing this without any stretching. So if you hear a one kilohertz tone, 
the radio frequency of that is one kilohertz more than whatever the dial says in your radio. Um, the other ad advantage of this style of viewing it is that you can actually hear what's going on. Uh, FSK sounds like two tones that are bouncing back and forth between them very, very quickly. Um, and that's because in frequency shift keying, the transmitter is sending one frequency for a one and a lower frequency for a zero. And in audio, these two are far enough apart that you can hear the difference. PSK sounds different. PSK sounds like a whistle that's wobbling just a little bit. And the reason why it wobbles is that the amplitude has to drop down to zero before the phase can be inverted. So even though you're not hearing the phase, you're hearing the filtering effect of making the phase legal to transmit. I would make noises uh, to illustrate this, except for some reason everything that I try to sing comes out the same tune. Hop on the magic school bus. Um, so uh, this upper side bend, again, could be confusing unless you think of it this way. Uh, you need to stick all this information into uh, your band, so the broader your band, uh, the faster your signal can change, so the faster your data rate, but you don't need twice as much space as it turns out, because uh, it's kind of like uh, sitting on the subway uh, uh, spreading out. You can actually cut out the other part and restore the uh, rest of it because they are symmetric. The, the reason why is that in AM, as you're mixing the signals together, you get um, two copies of the same message. You get a copy above your center frequency, and you get a second copy of the exact same data beneath your center frequency in the other direction. Uh, in single sideband modulation, you just filter one of these out so that you're only transmitting on the upper half or only on the lower half. Yeah, so just think about... Uh you know, cutting every human entering the uh, the subway in half and then using a mirror to restore the other half. Plenty close, of space. Close enough, right? Um, okay. <laughs> okay, so now, now we're going to get down to uh, our specific protocols. Um, we're considering uh, three people here. We have Alice and we have Bob who are trying to have a conversation. And we have Eve who is eavesdropping on the conversation. Um, now, keep in mind, this is amateur radio, so Alice and Bob will not be using cryptography. Um, and Eve has plenty of bandwidth to record all of the conversations that are going on. Uh, so Eve isn't really restricted by technical capability or, or by networking links. Uh, it's the atmosphere that's connecting them and making everything easy to monitor. Uh, and so... Uh we're going to look at really simple protocols, because that's what is used. Uh, again, to understand just exactly where the uh, places to hide the signal are, and uh, the possibility to exploit the differences between the receivers is. Uh, so RTTY, uh, also called RIDI, uh, is a military protocol from the 1940s. Um, when... Uh, uh, when Goebbels was writing to Hitler, pretending that he was able to um, airlift enough food to Stalingrad, this is the machine that would have carried the information. Um, the, uh, the protocol began to be used in the 1970s with post-war surplus equipment that was purchased uh, like at, at scrap metal shops and then brought home and used over the air. It features uh, a very um, low frequency difference. So y your transmission is only about 150 hertz wide. Um, and and it, it works by having a, a low frequency for a zero and a high frequency for a one. And then everything is encoded with five bits of data, no parity bit and two stop bits. Um, if, if this sounds like 8N1 or different serial port configurations, it's because the serial port protocol is descended from this protocol. Um, the ticker tape that you see on the, the right side of the screen actually contains a message that would be fed into a mechanical typewriter like this. You type in your message to punch the ticker tape, and then you can replay it over the air in order to transmit a prepared message. This way, you spend less time on the air. 
Uh, keep in mind that they didn't have very good buffering back then. So the ticker tape is the only way for the operator to um, operate it live without having to worry about um, typing too fast for the machine. In, in modern days, you use a program called FLDigi, or one of its competitors. Um, and these are available for iPhone and Android. So you can play with this uh, on your phone um, and actually send a message across a room by turning the volume up loud. Um, here at the bottom, we have a waterfall. Uh, this particular screenshot is taken while the radio is transmitting. So the only thing that you see is your newly constructed signal. The left vertical line is the zero, and the right vertical line is a one. Um, and the, the operator types his text into the blue window, and then receives text in the yellow window. And the, the transmitter will actually run live just a little bit more slowly than you can conveniently type. So you type ahead of it, and it catches up with you. And this allows you to have a live conversation. Uh, or it would, in theory, when you actually listen to what people say over this protocol, it is more boring than anything you will imagine. Um, they're just hitting these macro keys that are in the middle, uh, and the macro keys send pre-prepared lists of things. So uh, you hit one macro, and it, it, it asks if anyone's there. You hit the next macro, and it brags about your equipment. You hit a third macro, and it says, uh, you know, kind regards to you and your family, but this conversation's over. Um, the other part is the, um, uh, you have two different frequencies. So the big frequency is what the radio is tuned to. And there's a serial port that connects the computer to the radio so that the computer can retune the radio. Over on the right, there's another frequency. And that's the, the center frequency of the RIDI transmission. That's what's actually used. Um, that's the audio frequency plus the radio frequency. Um, and, and this is uh, audio that you can hear. So uh, you begin hearing it bounce back between the, the two forms. In the 1970s, they used this for ASCII art. This is Seattle Slough, the winner of the Kentucky Derby in 1977. Or any other horse. <laughs> oh, come on. Is it not clear which horse this is? I mean, Mr. Ed was a horse, of course, but this is not Mr. Ed. <laughs> the alphabet used is specific to this protocol. It, it predates ASCII. Um, so in this protocol, you have five bits. You have uh, 26 letters, and you also have a couple of symbols, like a uh, carriage return or a line feed. Um, but then you have uh, like your numbers separate from your letters. And the reason why the numbers are actually in QWERTY order is because on the keyboard, they were the top row. Like the, the one and the Q key were the same, the two and the W key were the same. Uh, and the machine didn't actually know whether you were typing letters or symbols. It just remembers when it sent the shift. The shifts, outlined here in green, instruct the receiver to switch to the figures alphabet or to the letters alphabet. Now, uh, the other thing that happened in World War II was that the Soviet Union, uh, forgive me, Sergei, kind of sucked at manufacturing radios. At the same time, their alphabet is different from our alphabet. So they needed to add new letters. So, Chitiri vodka, pajalista. So if you have the text for vodkas, and uh, you have those exact, um, we'll call them bytes, if you have that preceded by the letters byte, then you get the text for vodkas. If you send the figures symbol first, then you get uh, exclamation mark 974 space semicolon 9. The, there's actually a letter for who the fuck are you. It's <laughs> W-R-U. Um, and then it does a left paren and a dash, and then the bell rings. <laughs> but there's a null byte that was never used in the original protocol. So what they did was they added support for the third alphabet through the null byte. So when you send the null byte, nothing happens on a normal reading machine. But if you have a Russian reading machine, it switches from a Latin font to a Cyrillic font. 
And there you go. You get your vodkas. Yeah. So the little bear, he gets his vodka. He's happy. Yeah. The point is asking politely. Yeah. You got to ask politely. Um, and by the way, uh, notice the bear, right? This is an encoding trick. Can carry quite a bit of a payload. So the other thing that I told you was that this is a protocol intended for live operation. You have a human operator sitting at a keyboard typing. So what happens when the human operator types too slowly? Well, in this case, the letters symbol doubles as an idle tone. So as you're sitting there doing nothing, uh, which does happen, you'll see on the radio where some guy is at his keyboard and he's typing, and then he gets distracted and walks away from it. And there are just these two vertical lines running um, on the display until he comes back to his radio and shuts it off. So this is important because you've got to push 31 uh, uh, symbol per second, right? Uh, this is a different rate, but you still have to keep up the rate. Um, uh, this is 50 letters per second, I believe. Uh, so in that case, you just keep sending the letters tone over and over and over again. And as far as the mechanical machine is concerned, you're just reminding it that some letters are coming. But you can alternate these. You can have letters followed by figures, followed by figures, followed by letters, and at the end of the day, you're back where you started. The physical machine will crunch around a lot, but the physical machine crunches around and makes so much noise that that's normal. The standard digital receivers will just ignore the redundant shifts. So there you have a whole caravan of bears. This is uh, an engraving from uh, the 18th century by somebody who uh, purportedly has been to Russia and draw those from nature. Uh, well, <laughs> right. But let's imagine that these are real and these are bears passing through the village. Well, uh, imagine each bear carrying a payload of books. Uh, an earlier draft of these slides had Vladimir Putin shirtless riding one of those bears. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, this is a uh, simple encoding trick, right? Uh, we are going to get to modulation tricks as well. But for now, how about uh, another protocol? So PSK31 is what we did the majority of our experiments in. Um, PSK31 has a lot of advantages over RIDI. So RIDI was designed in the 1940s and uses, uh, uses frequency shift keying. PSK31 was designed in the 1990s and uses phase shift keying. A side effect of this is that the signal is a lot more narrow. So you can have many more conversations uh, in the same audio channel. With upper sideband, if you're transmitting and I'm transmitting, and we're transmitting on, um, like on the same audio ch channel, but in different audio frequencies, the signals just combine. And on the receiver's end, both of us appear in the waterfall. And the receiver can just choose either your audio frequency or my audio frequency to select a conversation. Um, because this is only 31 baud, and because it's phase shift keyed, it, the signal is only about 60 hertz wide, which means that they can be packed a lot tighter than RIDI, where your transmission is 150 hertz wide, and you need extra separation on top of that. The same software is used. So uh, FL Digi will imp implement both RTTY and PSK31 and a lot of other protocols. Um, but here, you have one vertical line instead of two. And it's the phase of that signal instead of the frequency of that signal that encodes the information. PSK31 works by inverting the phase to mark a zero, and you do not invert the phase to mark a one. Um, the, the waveform on the upper right is exaggerated. If you implement it this way, it sounds horrible, although it does work. The one on the bottom is exactly as you would see on the air. Um, so to do a one, you just have a sine wave. To do a zero, you have a sine wave that you change to a cosine in the middle. Yeah, just imagine that you have two generators of a sine and cosine and switch between them, right? Now, from the, uh, from the speaker's standpoint, when this little uh, sine wave just abruptly changes direction, that's the equivalent of the speaker physically moving outward and then being abruptly yanked back by the magnet in the opposite direction and with as much force as the uh, speaker can handle. Uh, there are similar effects in radio. 
the result is very broadband noise, and it hurts to listen to. Uh, not only does it hurt to listen to it, but it interferes with nearby frequencies. So in order to keep everything narrow, you don't abruptly invert the phase. Instead, you drop the amplitude. So this signal here goes down to nothing, and then it comes back. And at this scale, you can't see it, but the, as it's come back, it's now a cosine instead of a sine. And the actual transition between cosine and sine happens exactly here when the signal is at zero amplitude. The way that you decode it, um, if you recall that a positive times a positive is always a positive, and a negative times a negative is always a positive, and that the only case when you multiply two things that uh, the result is negative is when you do um, a negative times a positive. Well, you can do this to figure out whether at that moment in time the phase agrees with a past moment of time. So you delay the signal and then multiply it with itself, and it will only jump over the zero line uh, if the phase has changed. So for the changed phase, you get something greater than zero, and for the unchanged phase, you get something less than zero, and this allows your receiver to pick out the bits. Um, this is how a good receiver works. This is not the only way to build a receiver. Uh, again, think of it as a circuit that does just this for you and ignores everything else. So PSK31 also has a different alphabet. Now, in the 1990s, uh, ASCII had won out over EBDIC and uh, the other alphabets. Uh, Unicode was not yet around. So, uh, but ASCII still isn't very efficient for English text. Uh, Morse code, for example, is designed so that the letter E is the shortest letter. This is because it's the most common in the English language. Um, and lowercase letters are far more common than uppercase letters. So there's no reason why a lowercase letter should be as long as an uppercase letter. So this is the PSK31 alphabet. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit uh, to show you some specific samples. There are some rules for these. One thing that you'll notice is that the lowercase letters are always shorter than the uppercase letters. That's a matter of efficiency. The other thing that you'll notice is that no letter ever contains more than a single zero in a row. The reason why is that this is a variable length encoding, so we need to know when one letter ends and the next begins. And the rule is that whenever you see two zeros in a row, you chop it off there and whatever is in your buffer is the letter. Uh, on the receiver's case, they're just left shifting it, bringing the new bits in, and then whenever they see two zeros, they chop it off and they throw it into the character buffer. Um, and, and that's why they never contain more than two zeros. So every, every one of these will begin with a one and end with a one. So there's some tricks that you can do. You can vary the idle count to hide data. So normally you have two zeros between letters, but if you had three or four, it's still valid by the protocol. And this happens on the air when the PSK31 transmitter is idling. In the same way that the RIDI protocol will just repeat the letter's character as an idle tone. Um, also, illegally long letters are ignored. So in the 90s, uh, the author of this protocol is British. Um, ASCII is an American code. So he wanted to send the, uh, the symbol for pound sterling. Uh, looks like an L. So he couldn't because this is in the upper half of ASCII, and he didn't include it in his original code. So what he decided to do was to just include the entire upper half of ASCII as letters that were longer. And the reason why he did that was that the receivers would ignore these long letters, and if you didn't have a, an updated receiver running the newer firmware, there would just be one letter missing. Well, we can do the same thing. Uh, we can make them a lot longer. We can have as many bits as we like as long as we don't have two zero bits in the end to end it. And by running off the end of the buffer, we can then put a legitimate character at the end and take a lot of traffic with full usage of the available bandwidth without anything appearing on the um, 
eavesdropper console. Yeah. So, you know, how is that for a caravan of bears? Those protocols are essentially built for having side channels. Uh, but uh, these are still encoding tricks. Let's do more interesting ones. Let's do phi. So, uh, no, notice the cats. <laughs> all right. Now, when you're working with this, you have a radio and a laptop, and you run an audio cable between them. Some very fancy radios will do this internally, but not many. This is what the audio sounds like. Uh, what you're listening to now is part three of a lecture series that I've written on how to implement PSK31. Uh, the lecture series is in PSK31, and I will be transmitting it on 20 meter. So you know that this is a, a one kilohertz tone, and the, um, the strength of the tone keeps bouncing up and down. Oops. Okay, so this was produced by a Python script that I wrote. And this is a Python script that you yourself can recreate in uh, a weekend or two with some good coffee. Um, the way that you begin is that you have your audio rate. Uh, I, I generate these as 48 kilohertz wave files, uh, which is slightly off from the 44.1 that CDs use. This is just to make the numbers line up accurately. Uh, I, make, I choose a volume that makes the sample go up about as high as it can go without clipping. I then have a divisor because um, I'm not trying to make the signal as fast as possible. I want to make it around a one kilohertz tone. So I divide my audio rate by a thousand and that gives me the, um, the length of the, the sine wave. And then I need the length of a symbol to know how often to uh, adjust my phase. And that's the audio rate divided by the baud rate. The baud rate here is 31.25 because we, we have 31 and one quarter symbols per second. That's just about how fast you type. I then have a, an index in a for loop that runs through and creates all of these. Uh, I have a value at each given point, and then I have a, a phase, which is a zero for sine and one for cosine. Uh, it, when you first implement it, you get um, something sort of like this in the middle of your, your loop. Uh, and this sounds absolutely horrible because you're violently changing the phase and shaking the, the speaker. Um, so what you do is you filter it. You drop the phase down to zero, if it will be, ch you drop the uh, amplitude down to zero if the phase will be inverting. And then you bring it back up on the other side. Um, and that's as much as it takes to uh, generate this signal. And then, of course, you need the radio to shift it into the uh, actual radio uh, range. Now, if you don't filter it, then uh, what you're getting is this in your uh, waterfall. Uh, the reason you're getting this is that your Fourier transform has edge effects. When you uh, break off one wave and start transmitting another with non-zero amplitude, you get all kinds of frequencies springing up from the switch. And uh, this is the reason why it's not done. Uh, not only would that break your speaker, it would also pollute the airwaves with uh, uh, the receiving Fourier transform, seeing all of those uh, artifacts and seeing them as uh, changes of the signal, that is to say changing of the frequency, that is to say sine waves that you never meant to send. So in real PSK31, you drop the amplitude for each zero when you're flipping the phase. So if you look at the envelope of the signal in Audacity, uh, you can actually tell where the zeros are. So every place that the amplitude drops down to zero, each one of these little pinched places in the, um, in the envelope, that's where a zero is. And with regular spacing, wherever you don't have that, that's a one. So in this recording, you can sort of pick out the bits yourself. Yeah, so, I mean, you see a bunch of ones, for example, a single unbroken uh, packet there. So I was grabbing some drinks with a fellow by the name of Craig Hefner. And he mentioned that he had implemented a PSK31 receiver, but that he didn't really understand uh, or care to develop and debug the um, time shifting method. So the way that he implemented it was that he looked at the amplitude 
And whenever he saw the amplitude drop, that was a zero. And whenever he did not see the amplitude drop, that was a one. And he had a working receiver this way. Um, so you can do a trick to encode data by looking at the difference between those two implementations. So his implementation is a little bit inefficient, but it is able to receive PSK31 signals from the wild. So, so what if inside of a one, you drop the amplitude anyways? Well, a normal receiver, not Craig's receiver, but anyone else's receiver, won't notice the difference. But it's still measurable if you look for it. So you can build a receiver that operates both normally and with Craig's method, and then mixes the two, like XOR the bits if they disagree, in order to identify a hidden message. So on the top, we have um, a normal transmission. On the bottom, we have the exact same letter, but with all of the ones pinched down to zero. Both of these are interpreted as the same message by a legitimate implementation of PSK31. So there you have it, uh, a, a sneaky kitty. So the other thing that you can do is you can combine these, um, you can combine these signals without uh, wh whatever part they ignore, that's the part that you hide the message in. So this here is a PSK31 Morse code polyglot because PSK31 only cares about the phase and Morse code only cares about the amplitude. This is um, the spectral diagram of the letter K, which is da, di, da, like dash, dot, dash. That's what the waterfall looks like. This is what it looks like as um, an envelope. And then we can break it apart into the sounds of the letter. And now I'm going to play it for you. And you, you can actually hear the entire call sign come through the transmission. Whoops. Nope, that's the wrong one. So a human operator who hears this can interpret it correctly. That last one <laughs> is actually the audio file of the magazine that you've been given. The, the PDF can be played in mPlayer or VLC. Because, of course, why release uh, an electronic version that is not a polyglot? So you can do this polyglot between Morse code and PSK31. You can also do it between PSK31 and RTTY. Now, I mentioned that RTTY is a lot wider than PSK31. So RTTY cares about the relative power between the two frequencies. So the way that you build a receiver is that you... Uh, you split the region apart, and if there's more energy in the ones column than the zeros column, you have a one. If there's more energy in the zero columns, you have a zero. Now, normally, the transmitter will have the channel either entirely on or entirely off, but you don't have to implement it that way. Instead, you can make the stronger column just stronger. So you send maybe 100 watts on the right channel and you send one watt on the left channel. When you do this, you can also embed PSK31 in the column itself. So the, um, the left column will be a little bit wider than it should be. The right column will be a little bit wider than it should be. But on the receiving end, you wind up with two PSK31 conversations and one RTTY conversation at the same time and in the same amount of bandwidth. And of course, uh, the receiver circuit built for one or the other will get one or the other, right? Uh, this is wonderful because this really tells us what those receivers do. And of course, more modern protocols use uh, the same building blocks for their modulation. Again, frequency uh, or uh, phase shift. Uh, and that way we can start, uh, we can hope to start understanding more complex protocols and how to play with them as well, which is of course the whole uh, point of this trick. But uh, again, uh, physically, uh, this should be clear. Amplitude and phase do not really affect each other. So you have two orthogonal uh, channels. 
to send your um, to send one, one to send your message in, the other to ignore. You can also hide data in channels that are designed to be ignored. Uh, for example, um, forward error correcting codes are designed to fix a damaged packet, one that has been damaged accidentally by interference. Um, Drapeau and Dukes did this at DEF CON about a little bit more than a year ago. They did it for a protocol called JT65, which is designed for bouncing messages off of uh, comet tails. And JT65 is mostly error correction. The error correction is actually the majority of the message. And the reason why is that you're not trying to get a lot of uh, information through. You just want to get a little bit of information very reliably. So what they did was they calculated exactly how many bits they could flip and where to know that their message would be corrected back by the receiver. And then they've destroyed the error correcting capability of the protocol, but they've added their own message to the side and an eavesdropper will incorrectly believe that he's received the, uh, the correct message. Uh, or you can bounce it off of a closer comment. <laughs> Um, so, the idea of messing with error correcting codes, or, or with any of the techniques here, is that actually reverse engineering the message to determine whether or not there's a hidden polyglot or a, a steganog steganographic message should not be that hard, but good tools don't exist for it. So if you would like to play with this sort of processing, one of the things that I would like to challenge you to do is to take a QPSK31 message which has error correction. PSK31 does not, but QPSK31 does. They add an extra phase for that. Take that and damage a few bits intentionally. Take a message that's not correct. And then make me a tool that will tell me whether the message has bits because of accidental damage or because of intentional damage. Uh, can you recognize specific bits that were intentionally wrong by the transmitter and were not caused by noise? And how do you do it reliably and how do you do it without false positives? Well, and here's one for dessert. For dessert. Um, I'm sorry, you know, you, you can't have your pudding until you've eaten the, the meat, yes. So, as we were working in the experiments for this, we did a lot of them through a radio station that I have in Philadelphia. And I have um, an antenna that runs the entire length of the roof. And I also have an Ethernet network to connect everything together. And I mostly use this equipment remotely. Um, show of hands, how many of you have wired Ethernet wiring? OK. Um, keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. All right, now take your hand down if at any point when you've wired any network, you realize that you could just make the wires a little bit longer and it made it so much easier to do even though you knew it wasn't the proper way. No lying now. Okay, so I, I think one hand is still up in the back. Um, I sure did. <laughs> so. When you untwist those wires, they're no longer a twisted pair for that portion. And a little bit of noise can sneak out. Also, there are these really cheap um, Ethernet switches that you can buy for home use that like, you know really shouldn't be trusted. But the traffic seems to get through anyways, and you don't see any dropped packets, so what's the big deal? So the big deal <laughs> is the Madeline protocol. The idea here is that data runs over Ethernet. Um, suppose that the attacker controls a bit of that data, but not very well. For example, you might be connecting to my hidden service over Tor. As you're connected to my hidden service over Tor, I control a couple of things. I control how much data goes to you, in that I can uh, give you a larger download rather than a smaller download. And I can control the timing of that, because I can um, insert delays into my own side. So I send you like a lot of data, and then I get kind of stingy, and I don't send you much data for a bit, but before you time out, I start sending data again. Now, this never goes across your network unencrypted. 
So I'm not controlling the raw bits on the wire or anything like that. All I'm controlling is the bandwidth usage. Uh, I'm able to, to crank it up and down. Now, I also want to exfiltrate a signal. Let's suppose that I control this hidden service, and you are connecting to that hidden service, and I want to know where in Stockholm you are. Well, if the wiring is bad, it's not too hard to do this. What you do is you get a bunch of uh, trucks with shortwave receivers, and you drive them around the city that you suspect the fellow is in. And then you vary the traffic to send Morse code. This is a photograph of the letter K as transmitted from my house to my friend down the street. By um, the way that this was transmitted, I had a, a VNC session open. So I'm remotely using my graphical desktop. Um, SSH is normally better, but sometimes when you're using graphical tools, you don't have a choice, right? So I've got my VNC session open, and I'm looking at the radio receiver, and I see this really annoying line near uh, 28.120 megahertz. So I switch over to another virtual desktop on my client machine. So now the, the VNC traffic has stopped because the, my client knows that I'm no longer paying attention to that display. The line goes away. The line goes away. And when I move back, as soon as I move back to look at it again, the line comes back. So this line was showing whether or not I paid attention to the screen. Just so happens that traffic over the Ethernet network creates interference on 28.120 megahertz. And it does it in proportion to how much traffic is going across. So for this test case, I moved away from the screen. Then I moved back, and I time it. I can wait a few seconds. And then I move back to uh, another screen so that the line goes away. And then I move back, and I do just a one second, keep it shorter. And then I move back, wait a bit, go back, do three seconds again. And by doing this, I'm able to remotely inject Morse code into a foreign area controlling only the magnitude of the traffic and none of its actual contents, making an accidental transmitter out of a poorly wired network. And all of this with just a little bit of untwisted pair. Yep. So wire your networks properly. So the other nifty thing about shortwave radio, I mentioned that cryptography is not legal on shortwave radio. A few other things are not legal. For example, it's not legal to hide a transmitter to intentionally obscure its position. But this is done all the time. It's called a fox hunt. You'll take a transmitter, you'll hide it in a city, you'll ask everybody to go around trying to find it, and then you grab beers afterward, and it's a ton of fun. So you're not allowed to hide a message to obscure its meaning unless it's fun and you're grabbing beers afterward. So I have a 20-meter transmitter in the Northeast United States. This can transmit to the entire Western Hemisphere. It varies by weather conditions and that sort of stuff. Um, so what I would like to do is a, a sort of capture the flag competition in which uh, everyone who's interested throws up an antenna and starts playing around with different signals, trying to uh, make little crack me signal, signals, and then reverse engineering them. Uh, if you would like to play along in transmitting, you need an appropriate amateur radio license. Uh, these are available after uh, an, a rather easy exam in most countries. Um, if you just want to receive, you only need a shortwave receiver that can handle upper sideband. The cheap ones will not do it, but the high-end models are able to. Uh, you could also pass along audio recordings between each other. Uh, and so far as I know, this will be the first intercontinental capture the flag game that did not involve the internet or any public infrastructure of any kind. So uh, we're a bit over time, so we should be wrapping up. But uh, we would like to leave you with these conclusions. First of all, we would like you to see FIs in a different light. You would never 
uh, look at the phi uh, and see just the phi. You should be seeing a whole bunch of little machines, a whole bunch of physical tricks that make it work and connect them, and of course, all the little tricks that you can actually play on those machines. Uh, phi uh, seems to have acquired this uh, image of a black box, right? You basically plug two black boxes into two computers. These are your radios. You can't mess with them. No, they are pliable. They should be messed with, uh, pursuant to our local laws and regulations, of course. And simpler protocols like PSK31 and RITI demonstrate pretty much all the features of the grown-up protocols like 82, uh, 82.11 and 82.15.4. And of course, you need much faster software-defined radios to play with those, but it's actually possible to play with these with nothing other than your uh, sound card. And you can connect your laptops uh, using uh, a sound wire and um, uh, create your signals in Python. And all the while, while you're doing this, look for those parser differentials. Look for methods to make the same message appear different to different receivers. They abound, they should be understood, and we should not actually be building any of the Internet of Things uh, or other such like uh, dreams before we actually uh, understand them. Otherwise, of course, we run the risk of these things uh, turning into an Internet of Things that explode. And uh, last but not least, uh, polyglots are fun. You really only understand the protocol or a format when you have learned to abuse it and when you've learned to uh, actually hide things in it. Um, and you can do that not only in PDF, zip, GIF, JPEG, uh, WAVE uh, files uh, and others that uh, the previous versions of the POC or GTFO electronic editions have explored. You can actually do it with uh, Phi, with digital radio. So there. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you kindly. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, always impressive to hear you uh, finding weird machines like everywhere. And this is, this is really interesting. Uh, could we hear that antenna from here? No? Yes, you can. Um, to, to receive this as a receiver, you need a shortwave receiver capable of single sideband mode. Uh, if you don't have this, if you just go to a store and buy any old shortwave receiver, it will still sort of work on a good day. Um, you then need a very long stretch of wire. Um, for transmitting on this band, it's the 20 meter band and you need half that wavelength. So for transmitting, I have a 10 meter long antenna on my roof. Um, but you don't need uh, a particularly good length for receiving. So you can instead just take a, a long straight wire, run it out of your window to a nearby tree, and wire that into your radio and listen on the right frequency and the right time. I'll be tweeting the time and the frequency for anyone who likes to play along. Cool, and, but there's no information in the... In the, in the um Paper no, we've not yet scheduled the broadcast. Uh, originally, we were going to perform this on the 10 meter band, and then the sun decided that it hates me. So now we're doing it on the 20 meter band, which is a lot more reliable. Awesome. Also, I'm not sure if we're going to you know, talk about uh, how to track people using Tor. Uh, is that, uh... <laughs> oh, well, no, it's like uh, the Madeline thing is included at the end of our article on this subject which you can find in the previous edition of Pocket GTFO. Uh, so just look at the, the file name at the bottom of the front page, subtract one for that, and Google for that file, and you'll find a written description of the Madeline protocol and the uh, PSK31 polyglots. And okay. of course, you know, um, everyone has been talking about uh, uh, electronic emissions and spyware uh, and then spying on those. Uh, and this is the whole uh, Tempest kind of thing. But it turns out that uh, you don't need any of the expensive toys to actually hear this. 
Uh, this happened accidentally, um, and it took, uh, as I recall, a bit to figure out, but then we had to have a drink. It was, it was infuriating as uh, this like, annoying interfering signal only appears on the exact band that I, I need to use. And I mean, there are harmonics from it, but 28.120 megahertz is where most PSK31 conversations happen on the 10 meter band. So whenever I was using my radio, I would have interference. And whenever I switched to another virtual desktop, the interference would go away, but I couldn't see what I was doing. So, you know, your, your evil maid uh, could replace your cable uh, without actually putting any chips in. Your evil intern could do bad wiring. Are all interns evil? So people do bad wiring. Yeah. So questions from the audience? Oh, all the way down there. You guys can try to pick out books meanwhile. Oh, yeah. We, didn't we? Didn't we now? Uh, we gave the one book. You gave the one book. Here's another. Okay. Uh, do you want to give this book away, or are you planning on sneakily laundering it? <laughs> uh, do you have an accomplice in the audience that you'd like to win this book? <laughs> Hi. Uh, I'm just uh, curious there if this, anything of this is uh, achievable in uh, carrier, carrier Wave at all. Uh, polyglots, you mean? Yeah, CW, yeah, carry on. Yeah, so the PSK31 Morse code polyglot yeah. uh, is effectively in CW. You're doing more than a simple carrier wave um, in that you're inverting its phase, um, but it, it's valid in a carrier wave receiver. So if you have someone who's monitoring, say, the Morse code area of the spectrum, he will see the, um, the Morse code message and not the PSK31 message. The reason why you wouldn't normally do this is because a carrier wave transmission is supposed to be narrow band, and it's supposed to be very narrow band, like just the carrier. Uh, so it's even thinner than a PSK31 transmission. When you combine the two, if you do this to hide a message and you start transmitting, the receivers will notice that something sounds a little bit off in your message. And a lot of them are still doing their Morse code by hand and without a machine. So you will have 20 different uh, retired Morse code operators jump into the channel to start trying to diagnose what equipment problem you might have or to suggest wiring changes that could get rid of this interference. Uh, and at the end, it will draw a lot more attention to your signal than you would prefer to have. Um, uh, so yes, you, you can use these techniques with CW, Morse code transmissions. Um, from a practical standard, it's not what I would choose during the zombie apocalypse. So this is the vehicle of doom, right? <laughs> this, is, uh, this is a mobility scooter, and the stereotype um, has it that uh, hems do use those. Uh, hems do use these. Uh, what you're, you're trying to avoid when you're experimenting with these protocols is you don't want uh, a group of very talented, retired electrical engineers deciding to spend their retirement hunting you down. <laughs> <laughs> so to avoid that, do not be a jerk on the radio. Uh, you will find that you can do all sorts of experimentation as long as you're not a jerk. Uh, if you are a jerk, then you begin to get trouble. Uh, can we bring the microphone to the front for a question from Una? It's not a question, but I had a suggestion for the CW thing. Uh, you could send every other beep with a different space, and that is inaudible. Yes, you could. Uh, so her suggestion is that um, when you have one beep, you give that, say, in sign. You do your second beep as a cosine. And then on the receiving end, you do the, um, the multiplication of the one beep with the other at a fixed offset so that you get um, so that just like in PSK31 reception, it'll jump above only if the phase changes. Um, do you know how steady of uh, equipment you would need for correctly transmitting that? Quite steady. Quite steady, okay. Would the receiver need to be as good? Well, no. I think you could find that. Okay. 
you could correct the face uh, every time you get a new peep. All right. I think we need to try this. <laughs> Yeah, the, the speed of the channel is, is also like uh, a limitation here. So you're not going to be pirating Blu-ray discs over this. Um, <laughs> yeah, all you're getting is CQ, CQ, CQ. Uh, <laughs> if you wanted to and you were like happy to stomp on other users, uh, like the Russians used to do over-the-horizon radar on amateur frequencies, and the only reason they stopped, because it's not like the guy in the mobility scooter can threaten Putin on the bear, right? So the only reason that they stopped was that hams noticed that the signal sounded a little bit like a woodpecker. So they started making their own transmissions that sounded like a woodpecker. And whenever they would see the woodpecker signal, they would make a fake signal in reply, uh, which was not as strong as the original signal. So it wouldn't get over the interference from their perspective. But from the over-the-horizon radar perspective, it was as if there were this echo that didn't line up with anything, and then their displays would go to hell. And then they decided to use frequencies of people who wouldn't fight back. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, look up the Russian woodpecker antenna pictures. They are quite impressive. I mean, imagine uh, a really tall building made up of uh, antennas sticking out of a forest, a rather tall forest. Cool. Uh, I mean, the, the only thing more impressive is transmitting uh, using geological layers like the e ELF um, channel of uh, connecting to, of getting in touch with your submarines while underwater. And for that, you know, you need a, a specific geological uh, uh, substrate and hundreds of miles of it. Water is not very kind to radio. So radio engineers, when they're referring to uh, people who are standing in the wrong place, they call them bags of water, uh, which from a modeling perspective is not that inaccurate. Uh, yes? Take this one in front of okay. first then. Yeah. Real quick question. Yes. Has anybody tried to hide stuff in the spread spectrum? You can. Uh, you can do spread spectrum messages that are beneath the noise floor. So uh, over short ranges, you can send a message. But I mean, like, like using it as sort of a polynomial and saying, OK, I'm transmitting on this channel, and now I'm on this channel, and now I'm on this channel. Yeah, you can do weird hopping patterns. Yeah. Um, civilian GPS uh, also does this uh, hybrid spread spectrum to stay beneath the noise floor. And uh, the idea is that in the, the military end, you're not able to get the signal unless you know the hopping pattern, um, sort of. Uh, <laughs> there are loopholes, like if you have a good antenna, then it doesn't matter how much, how weak they try to transmit, because with the gain of your antenna, you'll be able to see the whole thing peaking above the noise floor. Um, similar to how you would attack, uh, how you would reverse engineer a polyglot signal that abuses error correction. You just get a really clean copy of it, and then you're able to um, distinguish between the accidentally corrupted bits and the uh, intentionally corrupted bits. So you see, the way we think about things, uh, these things is um, you can emulate some files with others, right? And uh, it'll be interesting to enumerate all such relationships and possibilities. So. Um, this was actually what led to this talk, uh, and hopefully will lead to a few more. You know how to do uh, m how to do less with more, if you will, right? Yeah. Um, uh, Sergey believes that it, it should be possible to make a um, family tree of which protocols can be combined with which others. Um, I think that there's not enough whiskey for us to complete this tree on our own. That's, um, <laughs> per, Add vodka. Well, I mean, we are. Uh, we, we should be having a Kickstarter project because we're running out of whiskey, right? <laughs> Does Kickstarter allow projects where you intentionally intend to blow all of the proceeds on alcohol? So, as long as you state it, I think it's fine. Okay, I, I think the end result of this is that those little books that you had here in like the 1950s where you had to get a stamp per drink, uh, that these will then be required by law in New Hampshire, where Sergey lives. <laughs> uh, 
Any more questions? No? Great. All right. In that case, thank you very much. Thank you.